Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on new thinking for agri-waste and co-product revalorisation brought to you by the Cultivating Collaboration Network. My name's Helen Glass, and I'm delighted to hear that we have over 100 delegates from across the UK registered for our webinar today, representing a diverse set of organisations who all have collective interests in this topic. This includes our colleagues from the KTNs, the Innovation Centres, Research Councils, Academic Research Groups, Scottish Government, tech-based enterprises, and of course, our co-ops and their members. This audience reflects why SOS launched the C2 Network in 2021 to build channels of interaction with those who perhaps traditionally may not have engaged with agri-co-ops, but who can bring new thinking to their sustainability and climate change driven challenges. Our agri-co-ops are at the heart of the C2 network and they have the ability to drive positive change in the agri sector by building collaborative partnerships, both within and external to the sector. C2N aims to harness that thinking for their prioritized challenges. Now this webinar is very much about beginning of conversations. And after each presentation from our three speakers, there'll be an opportunity to ask one or two questions. Now, please put these in the chat box. Once we've heard from our three speakers, you'll be asked to join a breakout room for further conversations before reconvening uh, here to, to hear the closing remarks from each of our three speakers. And may I remind you all that the webinar is being recorded and that will be shared with everyone that's registered. And you'll all be on mute until you enter the breakout session. Now, our trio of speakers will deliver presentations that will certainly stimulate onward conversations and frame these conversations for exploration of potential solutions to valorise waste arisings and which will sow the seeds for developing practical actions, not just on single farms, but at a catchment scale with co-ops and their members driving these opportunities. We're really uh, particularly pleased to acknowledge the support and contribution today from the Industrial Biotechnology Innovation Centre, who are one of SOS's associate members. And they will join the speaker lineup along with Professor Derek Stewart, who we know very well, and who authored the recently published Safari Gateway Review on Circular Bioeconomy Opportunities. But I now have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Peter Murphy of UK Water. Now, Peter's presentation at our first decarbonisation webinar back in, in March this year was so well received that there was no better way to open uh, this webinar by asking him to build on that and to take us further on that journey, exploring how an, an island example could be translated to mainland rural catchment basis to illustrate a range of collective opportunities. So which, without much further ado, it's over to you, Peter. Hi, my name is Peter Murphy. I'm a director of UK Water. Uh, UK Water is a company that was set up uh, predominantly in the water industry and now does lots of projects in uh, organic wastes, with liquid waste streams or solid waste streams, turning those into biogas or just cleaning them up, actually. Uh, we've had a track record of success with a number of anaerobic digestion project, uh, projects, and we're now developing a considerable number of other anaerobic digestion projects and energy projects where the organic wastes can be turned into biogas, and that biogas can be suppl uh, su supplemented to provide 100% energy supply contract, which means that an industrial user with lots of organics can have a full energy supply contract, including the low carbon element of biogas from his own wastes. This, uh, this has become a very, very popular methodology to decarbonize and to reduce the cost of energy considerably. Um, this makes 
Organic waste is very, very valuable. The whole idea of this today is about developing those organic wastes, revalorization or valorization of those organic wastes, and that could be agricultural wastes, as in the case here. So any crop residues uh, or other materials or wonky veg or other reject materials from the agricultural supply chain can be valorized considerably now to go into a, a primary uh, energy supply. So that can be done via anaerobic digestion and those organic wastes become very, very valuable indeed now because energy is so expensive. So natural gas, very, very expensive. The way to decarbonize natural gas is to inject, blend it with biogas. And that biogas can run a CHP unit, it can run uh, a direct factory for, for heating, cooking, uh, pri uh, primary project, produce from this agricultural supply chain, then going on to the supermarkets. And then those same supermarkets can have uh, their own return waste back into that same or different AD. And these can be injected into the gas grid across the United Kingdom or delivered directly by uh, a specialised uh, biogas tanker. It can be either in CNG, compressed natural gas, or LNG, and both of those are biogas versions. So I'd like to thank um, uh, Helen and Patty and the C2 Network uh, and SAOS for inviting me today uh, to speak on this particular subject. So the next uh, uh, 10 minutes or so is going to be around uh, a presentation. I'm going to play a short video explaining what we do as UK Water. Thank you, SAOS, uh, Patty and Helen, and to the C2 Network for asking our opinions. Uh, we've all got a problem uh, for the food that we grow and for the proteins that we grow and eat in the agricultural supply chain. So in that supply chain, clearly, there are residues, and in those residues, there is opportunity to revalorise uh, that material because we spend an awful lot of time, effort and energy investing in the growth of those of that protein and and, and those cereals and, and there's a real opportunity now to uh, use that material to reduce the amount of co2 that we're producing and the amount of carbon uh, from that that by turning it into biogas and added value products going forward so as you can see from the slide there are major issues there are oil rigs were the oil and the gas is coming from across the world in some cases. Sometimes it's coming from Scotland, as you can see in the Scottish oil rig there. Um, we're growing our salmon. Or we have our farmers in the fields. We have our processing centres. We have our grain storage. We have our tractors. We have our machinery. Uh, we have gas coming in from across the world and from Scotland. And, and we have oil coming in from Scotland and across the world. And all of that gets into the supply chain and it gets the oil companies, Grangeman is a great example in Scotland, gets into supply all the different types of fuel, different types of plastic, different types of chemicals, different types of fertiliser that we use uh, in this methodology. And then we've got to produce something with it. So the, the PAC Co example is a good example here. It needs energy, it makes added value, it may make cereals, it may make meals, 
uh, to produce the fantastic food that the uh, agricultural supply chain supplies uh, people in the United Kingdom and beyond. And all of that protein, as the Ukraine war has clearly shown us now, is very, very valuable. Um, we, are, we desperately need our farmers to become more efficient and better at uh, reusing re, re, uh, the materials in that, both in terms of the, the energy part and of the waste part. So today in uh, 2022, um, there's an awful lot of high carbon in this methodology. So there's methods now that we can embed to reduce that. That includes the waste materials in the agricultural supply chain. We're going to talk about those in a minute. And all of this is about reducing that CO2 in the atmosphere and having a carbon uh, uh, story. So if we can do this with AD and these wastes, these organic wastes, we can make um, a biomethane and that biomethane will be that carbon transition stage. So it's not perfect because you may have to top it up with other gas, which is a, a fossil fuel. However, it has a significant input. And currently in Scotland, we're working on a project that, that could be up to 50% of the energy required for distillation in rural Scotland, on the islands, uh, in a very large way, because the island of Isla, um, to reduce that by up to 50%. So it's fascinating tale how we can have a massive impact. So from oil to gas, there's a decarbonisation of effect of 80%. And then by using biogas, we can get that down to 90 odd percent. And then by being a little bit clever in the future, we can drip feed carbon negative fuels like hydrogen and um, and synthetic methane into, into that energy and become carbon negative in terms of the fuel. And that fuel can then go on to make carbon negative products for the pri as primary producers of those pro uh, pro products. Uh, that's of course very, very interesting to the consumer. A snapshot of what's happening in the agricultural supply chain. So we have the sun and that sun drives all of the uh, agricultural process, invigorates the soil, you can grow crops on it, you can grow protein in terms of sheep, cows, uh, chickens. Uh, we all need water, so with climate change, that is changing. So if we don't affect um, some change in the agricultural supply chain, the additional CO2 that we produce um, is going to have an effect on climate change and that may bring drier periods to our valuable land resources, or it may bring wetter uh, and therefore unstable ground conditions and changing conditions. So in terms of valorization of the waste material, so we can use it here, we can see we have the tractor, that tractor is now running on biofuel, fertilizers had maybe a biochar input to that uh, and, and other additives that we can uh, valorize from the agricultural waste supply chain. Uh, and that's maybe only 50% of its original fossil fuel content. So that's a massive uh, increase in the opportunity. Cows have got vast re vastly reduced uh, methane content. People like DSM, who I'm sure you'll know in terms of nutritional input in Scotland uh, for the agricultural community. Uh, these guys are, are setting up a factory employing quite a number of, large number of jobs to produce a, an additive uh, for uh, bovine use, which will reduce the amount of um, methane uh, from the animal's stomach. So it's a very interesting uh, time that we live in. Lots of en enzymes being worked on, lots of technology advancements in the agricultural supply chain. So I think we all need to play our part. And of course, the agriculture supply chain supplies the food, the the uh, primary food production and that then supplies the secondary uh, factory added value production which then in turn supplies the consumer via the retail outlets the tertiary distribution uh, of of the supermarkets and the retail chains so we're absolutely intimately linked in this story so as you can see from the diagram there's opportunities to put a biodigester near our agricultural assets uh, turn that into biogas, uh, run CHP, turn it into biofuel, take that digestate, uh, either put the digestate on the land or use the digestate to be pyrolyzed, turn that into biochar, 
put that back into the uh, directly into the soil or use it in terms of soil amendment and for fertilizer uh, amendment so there are lots and lots of opportunities emerging uh, in the agricultural supply chain and we're going to be working uh, if you like as a, an overall um scotland wide microcosm and isla in the, in the spaces so we're working with the whiskey companies we're working with the massive global whiskey companies um who have nine working distilleries on isla two in build at the same time and three now in planning on isla as well as having a very large malting plant which takes a lot of the scottish barley cereal crop uh, from various points around scotland and elsewhere uh, to Isla to be malted to to with peat uh, to produce the fantastic Scottish uh, whisky malt whisky chain uh, that we all know and understand and I'm sure a number of you guys will understand this particularly well probably being involved in supplying that particular product but of course this goes for everything it's other added value food products it can be used for aquaculture as well as uh, for producing primary protein in terms of uh, uh, um, cows, uh, chickens, sheep uh, and some of the residues from that material. So a lot to think about here. It's all about collaboration. It's how we develop this story. So if you look back to the 60s, as I said previously, um, you know, we wouldn't really understand this because we didn't know the effect of CO2, but we certainly know the effect of CO2 now. So you can see here, this is the project in Isla. We have a number of distilleries. We'll all be linked up to a pipe, single pipe. They'll work to the energy centre and they will take the pot ale, the spent lees and the draft and turn that in up to 50% of the energy required by those distilleries, which will uh, then be topped up by LNG. So you can see the input, the barley's coming in from all over Scotland and, and elsewhere into Isla. It was malted, used by the distilleries to make fantastic added value, uh, duty, fees and tax paid, uh, job creation, uh, added value, malt whiskey, uh, all done because we've got this fantastic barley in the supply chain. And that will then give us residues like uh, draft, uh, which will then be uh, which will then be digested, and that will then be uh, pyrolyzed and turned into biochar, which will restore the peatlands and the lands for growing barley. So this is a fantastic example of exactly how we can valorise and then revalorise some of the material in the supply chain that we have in Scotland. So this is a mini version of Scotland. This could be done in Speyside, it could be done in Aberdeenshire, it could be done with other industries. And it's fantastic to see we can reduce the amounts of carbon uh, that we have in the supply chain by up to 90 odd percent currently. Uh, we can utilise the, the embedded carbon in liquids, in wastes, and in, in solid waste like draft. We can enhance the peat, we can enhance the soil, and we can reduce the CO2 massively by valorising uh, those materials that were previously considered either co-products or wastes uh, that would have uh, some sort of use. Now, there's also animal feed. That's something that we've, we've got to think about, but actually... That also has a methane implication and an emission implication, and we're working on that closely with the farming community as well. But but clearly, uh, there are some it's, uh, um, um, hurdles still to be overcome. But in total, this has a massive carbon impact, and it makes technology intervention uh, really worthwhile to get the very valuable energy from the agricultural supply chain wastes and and co-products uh, the other the, it's quite obvious when you look at the slide we need to put money into this so there are people coming to this country people in this country uh, who are willing to invest in this as well as scottish government and so we have a fantastic story of collaborating with a large number of the world's largest drinks companies scottish government uh, adding value to this in terms of input and uh, uh, some funding assistance, as well as inward investors coming in to provide the technology and actually put in the risk money to make it work, where previously people would not have taken those risks individually as a, as a single company because it wouldn't work. You need it. You need to work in scale.
Thank you, Jamie. Um, good morning, everyone. For those who don't know me, I am Patricia Rojas, and I work alongside with Helen in the Siege Network and organizing this event. So Peter gave us a wonderful presentation, and now we have time for one or two questions that have been posed in the chat. The first one is um, from Malcolm. It is always Peter, it is always an uphill struggle to get big corporates to move to new processes, approaches. Would you see regulation or persuasion as the way ahead? That's a great question. Um, we're actually doing this at the moment. So let's speak from direct experience on, on that, that question. So on Isla, uh, we've managed to get Diazio, Beam Centauri, LVMH, and many of the other uh, global drinks companies and some of the Scottish-based strength companies to collaborate together. That's a really hard thing to do. I've been working on that project now for two and a half years uh, to get them to collaborate. But I guess what actually did get them to collaborate to a degree is that regulation. So if you're going to take a co-product in the whiskey industry, um, they have a co-product status, not a waste status or residue status. So it's quite, quite interesting. There's a bit of nuance to this, this story but it, it really applies across the whole organics chain. And if you're allowed to discharge that into the sea and there's actually lots of carbon in there, that's probably a crime. It's, it's what a waste of, of, of that carbon when you can actually valorize that and technology is available. Now, really what's happened is the cost of energy has, has, uh, has increased considerably. So that makes the project very, very viable. And I'll give you an idea on that and I'll come to the regulatory part and the driver part to finish with. So what happened was we did one project um, in a coastal distillery in the Highlands, and its return on investment went from 7.9 years to 2.8 years um, very, very quickly in the last seven months. So that gives you an idea of how uh, um, important it is to create energy from your, from your residue product, uh, 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 organics. However, there was, back then, when that project was done, which is now five and a half years ago. Uh, the regulation wasn't there at all. It was just about carbon. But now what's actually happening is there are things coming into play like digital waste tracking. So with organics, you can, the, the organics can quite often be lost in the agri uh, supply chain. And I don't mean to, to, to knock anybody up the wrong way here, but essentially um, some of those residues could be put on as, as fertilizers put, spread in fields. And then with climatic conditions, some of those are running in, uh, into the environment. So there's some issues around that. And I think SEPA are aware of that. But I think with um, COVID, SEPA are just waking between COVID and Russian hackers, they're just waking up again in that regard. And I think the, the, the collaboration that I've had with them is about there is the regulation heading towards valorizing these materials instead of allowing them maybe to go, some of it to go into the soil and the mechanics of that story is whether someone actually gets in to improve it and to what extent, over what period and what climatic conditions, if lots of rain or if it's a dry period. So there's lots of that um, unknown un, or known unknowns in that, in that story. So regulation is definitely heading towards uh, helping with the uh, not polluting the environment. So, so yes, I think we need better regulation, but it's starting to happen. Right. I think we have time for one more short question. So, Peter, what happened to the supernatant of anaerobic digestion? Sorry, what was that? I missed that, Patty. What happened to the supernatant of anaerobic digestion? Uh, yeah, so so it's essentially what we're looking at here is there's a number, of the, the, the methodology that's been used on Isla is two separate streams. So there's a solid stream and, and there's a, a liquid stream. And the liquid stream, literally by the technology that's being used, will take out 95% of the, of the COD completely. And you'll be left with very, very clean water to discharge. So essentially what you can then do is reuse that water. If you want to spend a little bit more money, you could actually um, put that, pro that water back into the product, but the Scots Scotch whiskey rules mean that you can't really do that. But actually that water could go back onto the land. And in, in some cases, we're now looking at taking that liquid and, and putting it into uh, onto the land again. So the opportunity there, so you'll take the, the biogas from the, the solids once you take it from the liquids and then take that clean water 
to put it back into the environment. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Well, all the questions that haven't been answered, um, just please post them in the breakout rooms. There will be plenty of time for one-to-ones there with all of the speakers. So now we will move to our second speaker, which is who is Derek Stuart, the director of the Advanced Plant Growth Center from James Hutton. Derek will discuss discuss the scope of agri waste in Scotland with examples of potential valorization routes we can be completely or partially done in farm, plus the technology and investment needed to do so. So we can hear from Derek's video first. Hello everyone, I'm Derek Stewart and I'm the director of the Advanced Plant Growth Centre here at the James Hutton Institute. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a kind of side piece of work or a fairly significant piece of work I've been working on for a long time now. It's the valorisation of agricultural wastes and co-products. Um, I have a long history of being a plant chemist and I recognised early on that the plant material, and actually most agri material, is a chemical feedstock that's not used to its full advantage. I'm kind of going to discuss that concept here today. Um, let's start off with the doom and gloom story. Uh, we know the population is increasing, and as the population increases, it needs to be fed, watered, homed. Um, and to feed them, we'll need lots of things like water, energy, and land. Uh, we're running out of land, uh, which means we need to use our resources significantly better than we're doing at the moment. So squeezing every iota of value out of feedstocks that are generated on farm. Many farmers are doing this already, but there are new processes coming in that can even lift that and diversify on farm business portfolios. So we need to shift from this linear economy you see at the bottom here to a circular one where we squeeze every iota of value. And of course, as the population is increasing across the world, most indicators suggest there's an increase in the middle class level and they, they, they're they wanting nice things, as we all do. Um, so the market will be there for these higher value products for a long, long time to come. But we generally want to lift everyone's life quality. So fighting against this is climate change. Um, I won't go into the conceptual details of climate change, but the consequences are we're seeing an increased general increase in temperature. We're seeing uh, variable uh, what they call precipitation cycles, rain, snow, hail. We're getting climate extremes uh, and extreme weather events. Uh, so the consequences for that, and I'm kind of telling you what you already know here as a farmer, is you're starting to see developmentally changes in the crop. They're getting pulled forward or pushed back, depending on these extreme weather events. Events you're getting crop failures, and in Europe this year we've seen a lot of crop failures due to unbelievably high temperatures, um, which is both temperature-driven and uh, water inavailability. But what we also see is um, because of the the change in climate and extreme events, you start to see harvest days are spreading uh, for a lot of things. So instead of having a nice tight harvest where you know the crops coming in. If you've got a spread harvest date, you get a spread in quality and that impacts up, up the supply chain. And of course, climate change is bringing in a new range of pests and diseases and invasive species, which again will reduce quality, quantity and generate waste. And of course, that all has a knock on effect up the supply chain and to the consumer or for just society in general. So what I'm talking about is adopting, particularly on farm, uh, is what I'm talking about today is a circular economy approach where basically we ensure that whatever is being produced, we manage to get the most value out of it and we can create cycles of on farm use of things. Now, farming has been doing that for years, but it's what we're going to explore here is perhaps alternative routes to squeeze that bit more value out of it. Um, and this is all talking about sustainability. So if you throw sustainability into one of these trendy word clouds, this is what you get coming out. Um, and that it's very much societal concepts that are in here, all about recycling, emissions, global warming, um, things like transport. Things. Interestingly, food doesn't feature here, which is kind of shocking to me. But what you've also got driving this is the consumer perspective of they, they clearly are getting the concept of sustainability. And, the, and there is an uplift in people wanting to eat less poor quality meat. And that means increasing plant food in their diet. Um, so we will get changing agri wastes and co-products as we go along. So I kind of uh, dealt with a lot of this in a report I did for um, Safari and Zero Waste Scotland, which looked at the circular bioeconomy opportunities from exactly what I'm talking about today. And this goes into a lot more detail and specifics and the business aspects of things. So I'd recommend you have a look at that. It's freely available, so please have a look. Um, 
with, so within that, what, what I did was I took figures for Scottish Bio Rising's uh, waste and coal products from 2014, um, mapped them out and looked to see what, what can be done with them. Now, some of them, and it has to be clear here, some of them already have uses, maybe low value uses. So there will be conflicts in terms of if, if you want to use uh, one feedstock for one use, whereas somebody else wants it for another use, um, they will have different values. And that probably will, will determine the way these things go. But overall, there was lots of wastes, co-products, bio risings, whatever you want to call them there, to the value of about 26 million tonnes. So there's a lot of stuff there to be used as a feedstock. So let's start off with a really high tech end. Um, we want to get rid of fossil fuels. Uh, we need to stop our reliance on them. We need to look at more sustainable processes. And actually, uh, sustainable feedstocks can do much, much of the things that fossil fuels do. So you take oil out of the ground, you crack them down to develop what's called building block cracker products. Um, huge value at the moment. Um, and then they're further chemically altered to create higher value products. Well, you can get to that point from things like cereal straws and cellulosic biomasses. Um, that works in the lab at the moment. It just needs the investment up to higher value to take it up to industrial scale. I'm not convinced that's something you would do on farm, but it gives you an example of the scale of where agriculture can integrate with high value chemical industry. The chemical industry will be a large offtaker going forward because everything around you wherever you're sitting watching this at the moment, the chemical industry is supplying probably 80 to, I don't know, 80 to 90 percent of the things you're looking at at the moment. So if you take cereal crops as well, you can crack them down to things like ethylene glycon, uh, glycol, and if you take that with terphthalic acid that can be produced from bacteria, you can create PET, one of the most common plastics globally, and create a whole raft of things, probably the most common one of which would be the casing around the monitor you're watching this talk on at the moment, or the camera through which you've got on the top. So let's bring it right back to the farm then. So if you look at things like, um, and we're doing a lot of work with people growing protein crops now. If you're growing a protein crop like uh, beans, fava beans, common beans, or it could be lupins, peas, any of these types of legumes, um, to get the best value, you really want to um, biorefine them. What that means is stripping out value into different components. So what you can do is you can dehull the beans, you can take those hulls and they, they can be added to cattle or pet foods, but actually they can also be a great source of uh, direct inclusion into baked goods as dietary fibre. Um, alternatively, well, and the kernels of the beans can then be, they tend to generate kind of two streams, which are protein rich or um, starch rich. And they can then be incorporated into something as simple as aquaculture, feeding in the Scottish salmon industry, or actually if the protein's clean enough, putting it into processed foods for humans, with the starch fraction going into animal feed as well. Or alternatively, the starch fractions can go back into baked goods or into producing beer and, dis and uh, distillery products. And taking that kind of concept of breaking things down, we're doing some work now, particularly on broccoli, on looking to fractionate that down into key components from waste. So if you're harvesting things like broccoli or kale, there's main stem pieces or less well-developed leafy parts. Um, so there's a significant pro proportion of crop left that doesn't actually go to product. Now that can be fed to animals, which is fine. But what you can do is fractionate that down into uh, high value things like white proteins, really cleaned proteins that can go into the human food chain and have some ancillary co-products like the fiber, the green proteins and what's called brown juice, which is like a sugary juice. They can all be combined in animal feed or the brown, goose, brown juice sorry, can be used for biogas generation. On any of these things, what you end up is a process map. Um, now this looks incredibly uh, complex, but a large proportion of that can actually be cited on farm or probably better cited in a cooperative because these things can take multiple feedstocks. They don't, it isn't just, for example, in this case, broccoli and kale specific. This will take in a whole range of different feed, uh, crop feedstocks and create different kind of products coming out of the end. Uh, an example of that is things like if you take bran from processing wheat, barley, potentially oats as well. Um, if you fractionate the bran down, you get multiple different products that have all got fairly significant high specific values, whether it's pre, uh, prebiotics, whether it's uh, protein enriched fractions, whether it's glucose syrup. Uh, they've all got ready homes for which a large amount of money can be or a significant uh, or usable amount of money can be recouped on. 
So for example, if you're fractionating cereals, uh, in this case wheat, uh, you split it down 100,000 tonnes into 80,000 tonnes flour, 20,000 tonnes bran. Through the processes I talked about earlier, you can fractionate that bran into multiple different products, all of which in total are more valuable than the flour itself. But then that has to be balanced against energy costs and so on. But if you were on farm or cooperative uh, renewable energy, this becomes extremely viable. We might want to go step back a gear and go down niche, so lower volume products like soft fruit. Um, so we know where the premium ones go to, they go as fresh fruit in the market, the lower grade ones potentially into processing of the jams, but there's much better arguably markets for that, whether it's sustainable colours going into cosmetics and foods, ingredients and antioxidants and processed meat products. So you can extend the shelf life to stop uh, fat rancidity, dietary fibres, abrasives, uh, natural polymers and thickeners and foods or non-food uses, or the most simplistic use, you take the fruit and you use it as with the distilling industry to create flavoured products. A really nice product or a process is one developed from a, a, a mate of mine, Martin Tangney at Celtic Renewables. He's done it and he's been extremely successful at this, from taking uh, wastes from either primary agriculture in terms of potato or the brewing and distilling industry using what's called an ABE fermentation system. This is a really old system developed in the 1890s, which using specific bacteria ferments into acetone, butanol and ethanol, which have got key markets. But what you also get is, is solids coming out for animal feed, because that's so that's a really good circular economy process. Um, sticking with potato, um, I've always thought potato above ground was a fantastic feedstock, a chemical feedstock, and it just isn't recognised. So if you were able to harvest above ground while still green, you can process that on farm. And here we have an, a back of a, a lorry on farm process system that will generate multiple fractions. So it could take the nasties out, the glycoalkaloids, but they can then be used on, and we're looking at that for sustainable uh, disease control in non solanaceous species, but it will generate protein. Now this protein might have some glycoalkaloids in it, so you wouldn't put it in the food chain, but there are non-food uses for that, like sustainable glues and adhesives. You've got fibre, which can go back on the land to put carbon back in, but what you'll also get is this component called solanosol, which is a really high value chemical that's used in the cosmetics and the emollients and the anti-aging industry. It's a huge value. So if you calculate, actually just on the solanosol value alone, the above ground potato is more valuable than the below ground. So I think we need to think differently. And here, this is what I'm trying to do today and identify these opportunities. Of course, you may have activities on farm that's generating heat and CO2. They should be easily trapped and you can utilize them in building or converting old farm buildings into vertical farms that will take the heat and CO2. The heat can be converted to electricity to power the LED lights and the CO2, the plants love that and it increases biomass. And of course, if you've got renewable energy on farm or you're taking this heat and converting it into electricity, you're really making a green vertical farm, which means this, the emissions of it are really low and it's very sustainable. And it delivers extreme levels of high water use. The crop yield is about 20 to 30 times that you would get in open field. And of course, you're creating produce that's, that's immediately available to a shorter uh, supply chain than imported from Spain, for example. So the other extreme as well is actually in a really emerging area and it's one of insect production, so black soldier flies. So you can take lots of these wastes and mill them and process them as I've described earlier. So the one I'm talking about here is you've got carrots where you could collect the carrot waste or it could be carrot tops. You take the protein out of that. You can take the beta carotene, which is the color from carrots and that can go into the food industry. But you're always left with a residue that's kind of low value. It generally tends to be a sugary fibrous mass this can be kind of easily broken down and used as a feed for insect, black soldier fly. And they themselves will then produce uh, what's called frash, which essentially is the shell casings and the poop, which is high in nitrogen, which can then be used as a fertilizer. Or the dried larvae themselves can either be fed directly as animal feed or processed into protein and oil and then onto other markets. So that, that whole cycle there is easily doable on farm. So hopefully I've given you a feel for how you can enter into this market. This is just the start of a discussion and a way forward. So there's multiple uh, processes that can be used to process agri-food wastes, depending on um, what end chemical you think you can go for, that's determined by the waste, and the volumes of the waste you have. 
Um, so this could be a low value change. So that's the kind of high volume, low value. That's the using them just to produce energy, animal feed, or even cracking things back to glucose. You've got medium ones like uh, colorants, antioxidants, or you've got the really high value ones where you're talking about breaking down proteins into high value sport drinks, things like that. So there's a whole range that we can discuss. And of course, we see that the farm system itself is evolving all the time, whether it's uh, on-farm energy generation, robotics and so on, the adoption of food miles, the on-farm market system where you're supplying food to a local area. This, what I've discussed on creating value from feedstocks all pays into that. And of course, uh, the, the on-farm energy generation and storage helps that to allow you to power potentially the systems you need to use them. So I've identified several different key opportunities you can go down. Um, interesting example from straw is if you take the wax from straw, it's got quite a high melting point. And that's the kind of wax they want to make lipsticks from in the Middle East because it's got higher melting point. So there's some really niche markets that these things can go into. And of course, for a lot of these, there has to be a certain level of investment. But many of these, at least for the first three here anyway, that can all be done on farm and it would process multiple different feedstocks. So it's not dedicated to just one type of feedstock coming out. And if you're doing it through a, a cooperative approach, you can really sweat those assets once they're embedded. So hopefully that's given you a feel uh, for the work that can be done and the work that you guys can do to diversify your own farm businesses. Thanks for your attention and hopefully we'll get some questions at the end. Thanks, Derek, for your presentation. We have two questions, time for two questions, sorry. And please just feel free to send them directly to us or post, post them in the, in the chat. So the question I have is, what's the up from market evaluation would, that a co-op would have to undertake to ensure a biorefining option was viable? Um, I think in any of these things, you've got to do a kind of scoping exercise first. And that's kind of what I've done in that report you can pick up on. Um, you, the main thing is you, you assess what wastes you think you have, and then you talk to your team chemist and find out what they can do with that to, to deconstruct that waste. And then those what you can get from it, you then look to see what end streams you can possibly put them into. Um, depending on the level of purity that's needed. For a lot of cases, you don't need to pure everything to the nth degree. You can have um, lower grade um, biorefining or cleanups. But invariably, for a lot of the things I've talked about, what I'm seeing is what goes off farm should increase the value of that feedstock by at least tenfold. Otherwise, it's not worth getting into the game. But it means it's really diversifying the on-farm business. And actually, uh, you don't want to have a single investment into a process that's only going to work for that feedstock. You want a, a kind of modular system, particularly for co-ops, that works well, uh, where you can take in multiple feedstocks as the seasons change. So, for example, if you're processing a lot of this agricultural waste, you'll have a certain set of technologies. But if you're in an area where you've got forestry, you might actually be able to take in brush which is the stuff that's trimmed off in forestry and process that in exactly the same manner and it will give you a different product, whether it's fragrances into the perfume market, whether it's, uh, for, and for the same compounds, they could be attractants or repellents for agricultural pests. So again, it's just coming back, getting a scoping exercise done and alongside that, we do the economic assessment for, well, how much is this going to cost me, which is always the base question and I'm fine with that. Most of it is usually steel. Steel and energy, that's the main thing. And actually, it's, invariably, I would say for a lot of these things, for the niche ones, um, it's less expensive probably than you would think. Yeah, that's very interesting. We have time for one more question. What are the main challenges to scaling these technologies and processes up? Um, brutally, money, uh, investment. Uh, and energy to power that system. So if you, uh, ideally, if you've got, if you're on a farm or you have a co-op and you've got renewable energy that you're, that you can divert to something else, think about converting your waste or your uh, feedstocks to something else that's higher value. As I say, you're doing a pre-process that will gain that value rather, and normally with things on farm, I've worked with farming guys for years, as soon as anything goes off farm, 
value goes through the roof because someone else is adding value to it. If you add that value on farm, you, you, you will gain that advantage. Um, so it's steel and energy. So it's an investment in energy. Uh, someone mentioned, I think, from Peter's talk about skills. This is another point that we need to look at. So this is where the integration with people like uh, the, the um, Industrial Biotech Innovation Centre are looking at skills and graduates coming out of there. They're looking for new areas to go into, to be honest. And actually the, the viewpoint for a lot of these graduates coming out is as a much more entrepreneurial coming in. So you may want to create, actually create a small business to do this. Um, and the graduate would be your person working within that. So all the bits are there. They just need to be joined up, I would say. Thanks, Derek. That's great. Well, we're moving last to our last speaker of today, which is Isabel Benson from IBIOIC. Isabel is a project and engagement manager, and she'll give an overview of the support IBIOIC can provide with funding, technical training, and networking, and some examples of projects of agri-tech that IBIOIC have been have found. So let's hear from Isabel now. Hi everybody, I'm Isabel from iBioIC, the Industrial Biotechnology Innovation Centre. Pleased to be here today to talk about agri-tech and the work that iBioIC have been doing in the sector. So for those of you that don't know, iBioIC is one of seven innovation centres funded by the Scottish Government, Highlands Science Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise. And um, as a group of innovation centres, we support networking um, and just stimulating the economy within Scotland and iBioIC is uh, specific to the biotechnology sector in Scotland and we're hoping to ease the innovation journey, develop more companies, help more companies get established and develop more products for global markets and really our aims are to stimulate the Scottish economy, create more jobs and growth. And what is industrial biotechnology? So this is something we get asked quite a lot so I've made a handy graphic to explain it, it to everybody here. So what we're trying to do is to replace the traditional petrochemical industry. So instead of using oil to produce our platform chemicals, we're looking at replacing the oil with plant-based resources, so biomass. And that's where your agri-waste really comes in handy. And instead of using traditional chemicals to convert um, the bioresource into um, chemicals and products, we're trying to use more bio-based processes such as using E. coli or yeast to create the chemicals, materials and products um, that everybody's used to consuming. And by doing this, we hope to produce greener and more sustainable alternatives to fossil fuels. So replacing petrochemicals um, with bio-produced chemicals, improving manufacturing, reducing waste and creating more bio-based products with improved carbon footprints. And we're creating some pretty nifty new materials as well. So it's not just always replacement, but we're making new funky things as well. And um, this is some of the examples of um, projects that we've been involved in so far. So we're right across different sectors. You know, we're, we're kind of sector agnostic. We're a platform technology that can support all kinds of sectors from food and drink to medic medical devices. Uh, biologics, treatments, um, pigments, materials, and food, uh, plastics, textiles, and fine chemicals and biofuels. So we kind of, you can ask me about any of these sectors and I should be able to give you a case study from any of them, I think. Um, um, and this is kind of our Bible, the National Plan for Industrial Biotechnology. This is where we get our remit from. So this was released in 2013, right before um, um, iBioIC was founded. And this is the targets that we were originally given um, by 2025. We were supposed to um, increase the number of companies that were active in industrial biotechnology from 43 up to 200. And we were supposed to increase the turnover to 900 million pounds uh, per annum. But in 2020, we had a look at the numbers and saw that we were actually getting pretty close to those targets already. And in terms of employees in the sector, we'd actually exceeded our target. So what we've done is we've done a refresh of the National Plan for Industrial Biotechnology, which you can see here. This is um, she went from one of our um, scale up centres on the front cover um, and we've actually moved the targets. So now instead of um, getting 200 companies involved in IB, we're going to be looking at 220 and the turnover we need to increase to 1.2 billion now. And we want to find another 1000 people active in the sector. 
So the way that we're doing this is we're providing funding and that's where I come in. That's my remit is looking after the funding portfolio at iBioIC. We also have technical expertise and advice. We have two bioprocessing facilities, which I'll um, show you some pictures of in a minute. We have networking opportunities and we have skills and training. So I'm going to go through each of these sectors briefly. So funding, this is um, where this is my area. So I run several different funding calls supporting different stages of a company's innovation journey. So the first one we have is the spin out funding call, which is £20,000. And that is for academic research that is close to commercialization. And what we want to see from these projects is a company being formed between one to two years of the project finishing. So usually this money, this £20,000 is used to do some work alongside another fund, such as Wellcome Trust Innovators Grant or um, Scottish Enterprises High Growth Spin Out. And, um, and we provide quite a lot of support to, to academics looking to and form a spin out company. And um, we've had, I think three of those come through now and, and start to form their companies. We also have feasibility funding. So this is for industrial academic collaboration. So it needs to be industry led. So we're looking for industry to come in with questions and academics to come and try to answer those questions using their facilities and resources. Uh, so we have 20,000 pounds, which goes to the academic to do work um, for industry. And that fund uh, runs regularly. The next closing date is the 6th of October. Following that, we have the innovation funds. This is looking a little bit closer to commercialization, whereas the feasibility is more proof of concept. This is a bit more kind of getting closer and refining those ideas closer to commercialization. Um, but it's industry and academic collaboration again, and the funding goes to academia again. So industry need to uh, collaborate with academia um, to get their product co close to commercialization and that one closes on the 1st of September so not too long until that one closes now. We also have the facilities access fund so this is for iBioIC members so this is industry to come and access Scottish HEI facilities so that might be for a small piece of work like um, uh, finding genetic data on their strain of interest or doing some mass spec to look at what um, molecules they've got in some samples and we provide £5,000 um, for, for the companies to access their facilities. That can go up to £10,000 in, in exceptional circumstances so if you've got something that is going to cost a little bit more than £5,000 it's still worth talking to us and um, we can see what we can do there. And I think these numbers at the bottom are slightly out of date now so I think we've got about 130 funded projects now and we've given out several million pounds um, to, to academia to work with industry when that has been more than 60 companies I think that we've funded and um, our success rates are pretty high if you compare us to UKRI so uh, about 60% of innovation fund applications are approved and it's about 75% of feasibilities go through approval and if you want to look at what our latest funding opportunities are at any time then you can go to ibioscom slash innovation um, so if you do contact us about a project, you've got an idea, we can help find industrial or academic partners um, to form those collaborations. Um, we can provide guidance and support on funding applications. So that's not just to us, but if you're applying to um, some other funding scheme, then we can do some draft checking on your applications or give some pointers or advice. We also review application drafts into our own funding streams, and that's really helped improve the success rate of them. Um, of the application, so it's really good if you can use that, sorry. Um, we can also identify and provide support for follow-on funding. So often when a project has been funded and we and we um, start to have project meetings on, on a project, we'll be talking quite a lot about follow-on funding, where are we going to get it from, how are we gonna make sure that the project doesn't lose momentum once our funding ends. So we usually find that we're pretty good at finding extra funding to leverage the funding that we've got from iBioIC and make sure that that the, that the innovation that we're that we're generating isn't going to go into isn't going to be forgotten about, but is going to go on and become successful products on the market. Technical expertise and facilities. So we have a number of um, two staff facilities with a number of um, highly qualified staff. So we have Rapid Bio, uh, which is housed within the University of Strathclyde, and that's for scale down and culture improvement for your processes. And then we have FlexBio housed at Harriet Watt University, and that's for scale up of bioprocesses. 
So really, we we can help in different different aspects of um of a, a process to get a product to market. We can look look at more analytical side um within the Strathclyde labs, or we can improve the upstream and downstream bioprocessing to to refine the process and make it more cost effective. Um, and these um, staffed labs, I think we've got about eight staff in them at the moment. They've all got really, really experienced backgrounds and can offer all kinds of support and advice. Even if you don't want to use the facilities themselves, then get in touch with them and um, get some advice on your process. A lot of what we do is networking, and that's a, a one big reason why companies join iBioIC is for the networking opportunities. So we have an annual conference, and um, the next one's going to be early March next year. Um, which is attended by around 500 people each year, um, not just from Scotland, across the UK and Europe as well. And um, it's really, really great for networking opportunities and talking to people across different, different sectors that want to use industrial biotechnology. And a lot of people say that it's been really helpful to kickstart projects or to, to get new supply chains working, to find new pieces of equipment. They're, they're apparently really great for industry. Um, we also have a newsletter that can give you news from across the community um, and there's a funding bulletin. Um, if you sign up to the newsletter, you'll also sign up for the funding bulletin, which is really handy um, if you're looking for um, further innovation support. Um, member companies can have their, um, their own stories, their own marketing materials promoted through our network and we have a, a PR team that helps us to, to market these stories. And any um, any project that we fund, we try to do a, a case study from and we get that um, a lot of those through our marketing and they often end up in newspapers or, or trade journals. So that can be really handy. Um, and we also have a member jobs board. So we like to make sure that the IB community are getting the best opportunities to move through the job market. So that's that's another big advantage of being part of iBioIC. So you can sign up to our newsletter at the bottom of our website if you want to keep up to date. Skills and training. So it's really important if you want to generate more jobs in Scotland to make sure people are being trained um, to work in those jobs. And we've got a really good reputation now at training up um, students from a number of different levels. So we run an HND course in Glasgow Clyde College and Forth Valley College. We also run an MSc, which is um, cross different universities. We take different parts of different universities courses and merge them into one in um, iBioIC MSc, so you kind of get the best of what is on offer across Scotland. We also have PhD opportunities, and we run um, CPD courses within our facilities to upskill people that are already working in industry. And we also run a Leaders in Science outreach program to go back into schools and colleges and, and make sure that everybody knows how to work with science. So I was just going to go through a few case studies for you next. So I've, I've mocked up um, what, I, what my view of agriculture is here. So we have um, crops grown, which can be um, turned into food for, for humans or can be given to animals. Um, and there are some byproducts from the crops, um, which I think we've got a couple of case studies on that I can tell you about. I also put in this, this flower here is to represent break crops that can be um, grown in between your main crop. And this world is to represent soil and um, soil improvement, which is something that we're getting more and more interest in now at iBioIC. Livestock um, can be made into kind of dairy products, meat or textiles, um, but we're quite interested in fallen livestock. And um, this is particularly relevant for the aquaculture industry where there's becoming more and more of a market for fallen stock. And we're interested in what the uses of those might be where the regulation is holding us up and what we might be able to do about that. And then we have a few byproducts from the livestock as well. So we have a few kind of chemicals that can be produced, we've got proteins, and we've got waste products such as feces. And I've got a couple of case studies in different areas here. So one that I've actually been quite involved in is a sugar beet story. And I know that a lot of people in this audience are probably involved as well. So I don't want to labor this one too hard because you probably know a lot more about it than I do. But the, the basis is that um, currently Scotland is importing a lot of its ethanol. And the, we think that there's probably a way that we can produce this ethanol within the UK um, using sugar beet. So 
what IBRC did is we commissioned a report which was released in November, November last year, outlining the opportunity to industry. Um, and I think there was a lot of opportunity there. Um, and there was also opportunity not just to produce ethanol, but to reduce emissions as well. And there were quite a lot of carbon savings from moving to um, sugar beet as a source of ethanol. Um, but not just for producing ethanol, I think um, the case um, outlined that there was an opportunity for all of biomanufacturing uh, with sugar as a feedstock into a whole host of um, biochemistry, uh, which would be really good to attract more industrial biotechnology to Scotland more generally. So we see that as a, as a big opportunity moving forward and IBRC is still pushing to, to take that forward and to get investors in and business in to make sure that that happens. Um, another one um, I wanted to talk about was uh, a company called Revive Eco. I actually worked with Derek Stewart that is with us today. Um, so Revive Eco have a, a process to extract um, high value chemicals from waste coffee grounds. So they collect the waste coffee grounds and they've got various processes to extract oils and different chemicals that are going to a whole range of, of um, products such as textiles and cosmetics. But what they wanted to do is find out if there was a use for their, their end product, which is the extracted coffee grounds. Um, so they teamed up with Derek Stewart from James Hutton Institute and tested these coffee grounds as a compost additive for strawberries and lettuces. And um, Derek and his team did a few growth trials and measured the number of strawberries and lettuces and the sizes of them. Um, and the benefits uh, from the extracted coffee grounds were actually not strong enough to warrant further investigation um, or investment in this route for, for Revive Eco, um, which they were actually really pleased to find out because they had a number of different leads that they wanted to go down. So it was really useful for them to be able to rule out that avenue. And uh, we funded that project using um, £15,000 feasibility funding. Um, and I think now Revive Eco are, are investing more into looking at um, the extracted coffee grounds for use in cosmetics. So that that was a feasibility study that didn't sort of work in an expected way, but the company were really pleased to be able to rule out that avenue. Um, another case study I wanted to go over quickly was Scottish Leather Group. So Scottish Leather Group are a large, large processor of animal hides. Um, and as part of their process, um, they, they, they extract a lot of value from different parts of the animal hide, and um, they like to, to consider that they're absolutely zero waste. And one of their products that they form is Greaves, uh, which was traditionally put into um, pet foods and was quite low value. So what they did was they spoke to Harriet Watt University and teamed up with Nick Willoughby and Kelly Stewart to test out whether the Greaves that they were producing had any other activities. So Kelly and, and Nick um, performed a whole range of tests and found quite a lot of potential activities of this um, protein mixture. Um, and they processed it in various ways and, um, and actually got quite a lot of success. So this, um, this was really interesting to Scottish Leather Group and they wanted to investigate further. So we helped them to apply for an Innovate UK uh, knowledge transfer partnership. So they've got further funding from Innovate UK to take that forward. And I think that's going to bring a lot of value into the company and make something that was quite low value into a, a high value product. And I had a lot of cases that I wasn't going to, didn't have time to talk to you about today. So if you wanted to look at um, other case studies from different parts of the agri-tech sector, um, then you can look on our website or you can send me an email and I can talk to you about some of those. I just wanted to finish off with a few high level figures. And um, so we have welcomed a lot of students into our programs. So the PhDs, MSCs and HNDs. So we're looking at nearly 400 students now that have come through our programs. And um, I think we've got 130 innovative collaborations now. The state is just until 2021 um, and supported over 200 companies on their innovation journeys. We've invested nearly 20 million pounds into IB activities. So that's including our facilities, equipment that, um, that people have access to, network building and educational programs. And the project's budget that I manage, we've invested 6.4 million pounds into innovative collaborations. 
and that has leveraged into nearly 30 million pounds worth of activity. And if you want to get in touch with me, then you can find me on email there, isabel.vince.ibrc.com, on Twitter, where I'm actually not very active. So you're probably better to find me on LinkedIn. So feel free to, to contact me on LinkedIn if you want any more information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. That was very, very insightful. I'll let you hear about your case study with wool, but I'm sure you'll touch that in the breakout rooms. Um, just a short question before we jump to our breakout rooms. So, Isabel, could you give an example of how, how the types of funding that Bio, IBIOIC offers could progress some of the projects that Peter or Derek um, spoke earlier on? Uh, well, Derek's, um, Derek um, has quite a lot of interaction with IBIOIC and uh, we have funded a number of projects at James Hutton already, but the kinds of things that he's talking about are exactly the kinds of things that we would love to fund. Um, what we need is an industrial partner um, to lead um, the project. They have to come up and say that they're going to take something towards commercialization and then academic partners can come in and, and help to, to realize that for the industrial partners. Um, so yeah, that's exactly the kind of things that we would fund. In terms of anaerobic digestion, we do fund anaerobic digestion projects as well. Um, and we funded a couple on, um, on draft utilization for anaerobic digestion. Um, it was, I think the one that I'm thinking of there was um, about building a, a module, a, a modular AD plant that can be kind of, um, as an example that can be kind of put on different um, whiskey uh, distillery sites. So it's just the kind of thing that Peter has been talking about. That's the, really the kind of thing that we do fund. That's great. Well, before we move to the breakout rooms, just a uh, quick mentions on that. We'll, each a speaker will host one of the breakout rooms. Make sure you get all your questions there. Um, towards the end, we'll be able to put a summary of what was discussed. You are able to jump in and out all the breakout rooms freely if you want, and we will get an alert of 30 seconds before we're pulled back from the breakout rooms for the farewell and final part of the session. But I want to bring again our speakers to just make a summary of what was discussed and hope everyone had a good session as well. So Peter, if you have any voice still after all the questions that we ask you, do you want to give an overview or just some key points of what we discuss in the group? So um, this has been a fantastic webinar. I have learned so much, not only from the, the chat box, but from Isabel and Derek and I'm going to take take my learnings forward here. But for me, what I really learned, and I learned it from the strategic position, listening to Isabel, fantastic um, uh, uh, um, organization, IBIOIC, and from Derek, the James Hutton Institute. These are fantastic world leading opportunities uh, to, to innovate. But it's quite clear to me what's missing is the supply chain. So the Tesco's, the co-ops, the Asda's, the Waitrose, John Lewis, all of these guys actually need to get their act together. It's about collaboration. So if they're taking primary produce, we should they should be much more interested in the residue and therefore the total carbon input, CO2 input, and the valorization of an added value products to create GVA in, in Scotland. Because we've the the the, the the SDFC and others that are investing talk to, to um, uh, the, the advanced manufacturing. There's opportunities there to build AD, to, to valorise biorefineries, keep the information Sheena talked about in Scotland to build this value chain. So, so it's easy for me to say that. What's the hard part? The hard part is actually getting everybody together. So what I'd like to do from this is Ivan McKee is the trade, trade minister. He has helped me enormously we should all be talking to Ivan McKee, put him in a room with us lot and actually get talking to him about how we valorise this. If we don't do that, it's too difficult to see the whole jigsaw puzzle. So each one of these in this, this frame today is a part of that jigsaw. And, and it's by getting these guys to act so that other people can help valorise this whole agricultural residue supply chain. That's what I've learned today. That's great. Thank you, Peter. Derek, you want to take us through our your findings? Yeah, um, there was definitely a few learnings came through. I think the key one uh, is uh, we need to change languages. Um, 
let's use co-products rather than waste on, as a default basis, because waste comes with connotations and regulations. Um, regulatory authorities get a bit shaky when you start to talk about wastes being used for potentially going into the food chain, for example. That, that sets off alarm bells. Um, I think to, to make a good dent in this and to start balls rolling, we need to get better data on volumes that are being generated out there. Now that might, that I'm not talking about has to be nationalistic level, it could be within on farm, what single farm, it could be co-op level, it could be county, whatever. Um, and that gives you, that geolocation aspect gives you a feel for where specific processes may be based. Um, to kind of flip that where you've got co-ops or co or collectives of people like-minded ones who are uh, geographically spread, what we can do is develop the processes and take the mountain to Muhammad. So develop the process that will go to those people rather than centralizing these co-products in one place. Um, that could be a very valuable route forward. I know certainly I'm working on something where they're doing that in Thailand for shellfish wastes because they've got quite a long spread where they'll produce that. So they'll take the machine to that, process the waste there, and they both leave the, the waste of the waste or the co-product of the co-product and the high value stuff there. And that company then knows what it wants to do with it. So those approaches are there. The, the last thing is that this allows for new business models to be developed. So again, if you're talking about it, maybe a new company will come in and valorize the waste. Um, and people with entrepreneurial skills coming into that. I mean, we're seeing that for the kids that are, or the kids, just tell you how old I am. The younger career scientists that are coming out through the Industrial Biotech Innovation Center, they get this kind of training and the the mentality of the earlier career people coming through now is different from when I started. Jobs for life are gone. So they're looking to really create their own future. So I think the skills, technology, and opportunities are all there. Thank you very much. And either Kim or Isabel would like to give a, give us their takeaway messages from the from the rooms, from the room. Do you want to go, shall I? <laughs> and, <laughs> Now, this is my fault entirely. We got a bit carried away with introductions, so we didn't get <laughs> to too much um, nitty gritty. But it was just really good to hear a bit about everybody's background and, and a couple of um, connections were made. So, so that was really promising. Do you add anything as a part of that? Um, I don't think so. We touched a little bit on regulation of waste streams. So I think Derek's really nailed it there, where he says that we need to start calling it coal product rather than waste. Um, but I think we really need to somehow engage with SEPA more and we need to find a way in and keep those conversations going, make it more, much more of a dialogue with SEPA and um, tell them where the industry is going and how they can help support us and make sure that um, we're investing in the right things and 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 what, what we need regulation to do um, for us. Thank you very much, Isabel. Now I'm gonna move on to Helen for the last remarks for the webinar. Well, it, it does remain for me to thank each of our three speakers, Peter, Derek and Isabel, for providing not just informative presentations, but sparking the conversations that also came out in the, the breakout se sessions and stimulating the thinking that hopefully all of our delegates can take away and reflect upon. For myself, I thought it was really interesting, the ideas around the investment, not just investment for funding for infrastructure, but the investment that's required in terms of skill development in these areas of the circular bioeconomy. And the ideas around entrepreneurial activity to sit alongside co-ops in that biorefining hubs as well to drive these um, opportunities. And I think the, what others have said about uh, you know collaborative ventures, scaling up, flexibility, we actually need after this meeting to think about how do we bring the different parties together. Peter's already suggested someone from Scottish Government actually talking more about how do we reach the vision uh, that we, we outlined um, at the start of this webinar. But as I said at the start, this is really just the beginning. But what happens next is, is, is really important, equally important. Firstly, we want to hear from you as to how your organisation can contribute to that new thinking, whether it's around these business models, including entrepreneurship, the technology options, and as well as how the emerging science from our research institutes, from our universities um, across the UK can contribute to that circular uh, bioeconomy 
at a catchment scale and contribute to our co-op strategies for decarbonizing their operations and looking at diversification into other market opportunities. And as part of that next journey um, um, to support the visions that both Peter and Derek put forward and think about how do we, through feasibility and innovation funding and engagement with iBioIC, for instance, can de-risk some of these approaches. And in our breakout session, Derek was saying about bringing uh, different types of co-ops together to talk about what waste streams or co-product streams do they have and working with the likes of Zero Waste Scotland. But that whole collaboration piece is going to be so important to drive change at scale in rural landscapes. So the secondly, we want to encourage everyone here to connect with us through the various channels which will be closed on our uh, closing slide. And that will ensure that all of you are also connected into other C2 network activities around green hydrogen and earth observation and data delivered uh, topics um, as well. So th there's, there's, there's a lot to do. And as somebody has said, how do we get connections made between people that are on this webinar? If they haven't shared their email address, do email myself or Patty, and we can facilitate that, that introduction. But finally, we'd like to thank Jamie from SBN, who once again has provided excellent technical support in the background for this webinar and has issued all these gentle reminder emails in the lead up to this webinar to make sure as many of our delegates were able to join as well. So we look forward to continuing the conversation and the circular bioeconomy journey with each and every one of you and what you can bring to the co-ops to look at the opportunities ahead. Thank you for joining us today.